Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today we're talking again remotely with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon in Ashtabula, Ohio. He's also the medical provider for the Great Center in Geneva, Ohio, a sports medicine complex in Geneva, Ohio. Thanks for joining us once again, Dr. Seeds. Randy, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Well, Dr. Seeds, what I thought we would do is, is follow up on our last discussion about the acromioclavicular or AC joint separation and really talk about a, a little different but very similar problem uh, that affects that joint and that's, that's the joint that becomes arthritic. And I think a lot of those folks probably had grade one or two AC joint separations that have injured the joint and years down the road they can develop a, uh, an arthritis or a wear and tear arthritis also called arthrosis and that becomes very painful. So today what I thought we would, we could do is, is go through and talk a bit about the management of patients with AC joint arthrosis. So for patients that, that haven't uh, uh, taken a look at the, the previous um, video, can you just give us a brief description of, of what the acromioclavicular joint is, where it's located, and, and what the function of the AC joint is? Sure, Randy, the, the AC joint is we refer to it as the acromioclavicular joint. It's the clavicle that comes in and attaches to basically the scapula. And the scapular attachment is the acromium, which is the distal part of what we would reference as the shoulder. And the joint is about a centimeter and a half to two inside where the clavicle attaches to the acromion. And that attachment or that articulation of, a, of that joint is kept intact by ligaments that span uh, the acromion and the clavicular that, that attach the scapula to the clavicle and also um, certain ligaments that attach to the clavicle that come from what's called a coracoid bone that's also part of the scapula um, but it attaches to the clavicle from, from underneath. So there are two there, there are actually three sets of ligaments, but there are two specific areas where the, uh, the clavicle is, is kept in place based on its, uh, the, the, uh, the ligaments around there. And uh, that's kind of how we will classify injuries um, to the shoulder based on the degree of ligamentous injury. And, and in referencing the, uh, these patients that, that do get arthritis around this joint, typically in their past um, they've had some type of shoulder injury and had some minimal or, or p potentially major disruption of these ligaments where there's been disruption in the joint space and, and eventually they've developed an arthritis within that joint space. And you know, I think it would be worthwhile pointing out to a patient that, that this is a very common problem. I mean, we, you and I probably see a lot of patients who have pain that is coming from their AC joint, whether they can remember having an injury or, or really whether they've had an injury or not. I think as we age, that, that joint does get a lot of wear and tear. It's not a weight-bearing joint, but I think that that joint, um, as we reach and do things, lifting and that sort of stuff every day, gets a lot of, uh, a lot of stress. So it's not uncommon to, to see patients who develop a bit of a bump there that comes from the bone spurs that, that form around the joint, and that joint can, can be a real nuisance uh, to a lot of people. When you see these patients in your office, how do you proceed in terms of, of the evaluation? Well, these, these patients that typically present with this problem are usually in their, um, I've seen them in their late 30s. M most of them are in their mid 40s and, and, and up. And, and typically they'll present with shoulder pain that's been going on for not just a few weeks, but months to up to a year or longer, where they've kind of had it off and on and they've, they can still, they still have function of the shoulder, but they have, uh, a pain that just doesn't progressively improve and they'll go through periods of where it, it typically may bother them. Um, they'll even tell you based on weather conditions uh, sometimes. So there's a, they'll come in with some different complaints but they'll still have function of their shoulder but it's a painful function. And so when they, they present I'll typically have an x-ray that'll be done of, of that patient and 
in combination with the x-ray and the exam, I'll try to isolate where that problem is. And if it is the AC joint, usually if it's an arthrosis or arthritis as we describe it, we'll see some changes around that joint that'll be consistent with what you had referred to as some bone spurs where there'll be some spurring of the joint and in particular that spurring uh, can have an effect on the rotator cuff where it can be directly digging into the rotator cuff and, and having even a greater effect on shoulder function and and even having an effect of what we call impingement with something impinging in the joint uh, of the of the shoulder itself from that from those bone spurs so that's kind of how I, I do my initial exam in combining the x-ray with the observation and the exam and inspection itself. Now, do you usually feel that there's any reason to go to more advanced imaging like an MRI scan or a CAT scan or anything like that? Yes, w with some patients, if I detect that there's a rotator cuff weakness, um, I will progress to an MRI because those patients sometimes, if the arthrosis is significant and it's occurred over a long period of time, sometimes those patients will have partial rotator cuff tears. Uh, I've been even surprised to see sometimes uh, small full thickness tears uh, that are directly related to that uh, effacement or that pressure from the bone spurring of, of the shoulder. So there are, again, depending on the exam, there are some patients that, yes, I will do the MRI evaluation to evaluate specifically that rotator cuff. Um, and I have found also where I suspect um, there some other labral injuries can be associated with injuries in the past also. And I may detect on exam that or may feel that that may be a component and also advise an MRI and, and will pick up a, a labral injury that's also associated with it. Let's move to treatment now. How are you going to, to, tr to recommend treatment to that patient after you've you've evaluated the, the joint and uh, whether or not you've gotten an MRI scan, you've made a diagnosis of, of AC joint arthrosis and that the pain is coming from the AC joint, what's next? Well, depending on the significance of the, the severity of the symptoms, uh, the, most of the patients, what I'll try to rec what we'll discuss is the possibility of an anti-inflammatory and then work on sp some specific rotator cuff muscle strengthening exercises to see if see if we can control or stabilize that shoulder a little bit in, in controlling that AC joint pain. And what I'll try to do is follow them. I'll even, it could be a home program or it can be working with a therapist, but what I'll typically do is try to get them going with that for about a two week time frame. And then I make a second assessment at about two weeks as to how they're progressing and what I may be able to do to improve that, that progression if they are seeing that improvement or if they're not. And, and that's, that's, for me, that's a real nice way of being able to get a good assessment of where this injury is going to go. Um, for the patients that, that say they, they're progressing with therapy, but they still, the, the anti-inflammatory hasn't done enough to help them with that pain, this is sometimes where I'll, I, I'll take the opportunity to uh, give them the choice of possibly injecting a, a steroid, a cortical steroid into the AC joint or sometimes I'll do it subacromial, but underneath the AC joint, depending on how, where I think that pain is more significant, um, and uh, to assist them in progressing with their rehab. And, and that, that's where I find that to be very beneficial. And, and even if the patients aren't progressing at all with their PT at that point, then I may even, you know, I may be more, the, the recommendation may be more significant about trying this, this injection. And again, as long as I don't think there's a rotator cuff injury there, that's the step that I'll take. You know, it's interesting. You, you bring up an important point, and I think that uh, that is that these injuries are sometimes, or these problems are sometimes not an isolated AC joint problem. And sometimes it, the AC joint, or sometimes there's just uh, another problem that's along for the ride, so to speak, that's, that's coming on with the whole degeneration and aging process of the shoulder. I guess my question is this. In the patient where you just have an AC joint problem and the rotator cuff is okay and they, they don't have any other uh, uh, pathology in that shoulder, 
what do you think the physical therapy is really doing for that patient? Do you, do you feel like it's still a benefit to, to go through a shoulder rehab program? Yeah, I, I do, Randy. I feel that in those patients that if they're not, if they're not typically an active patient, I feel that any, any stabilization or, or work that can be done with, with improving the rotator cuff function of the shoulder will have an improvement. I found that to have a significant improvement with, with just isolated AC joint injuries. Um, and the, uh, and also in developing their their confidence of progressing on back to their you know their their related activities. I I just think that all I think there is a uh, my thought on that is that a lot of these patients that I see show up you know a year up to a year later after they've had progressive problems. I feel their shoulder is deconditioned to start with that they're they're and their function of using that shoulder isn't the same as their opposite extremity. And I feel that, that in, by, by taking them through a rotator cuff strengthening program, we help them significantly in reconditioning um, that, that shoulder in getting them back to uh, an active uh, lifestyle and, and preventing, preventing problems later on with that too. So I guess your point is, is that, and I agree with you, that, that most of these patients who have put up with pain have compensated for that pain in ways that have created weaknesses in their shoulder that if, if, if for nothing else, if they recondition the shoulder, the shoulder's going to function better. And if they need something further done to the AC joint, they're probably going to be far better off. Um, for example, if they need surgery or something, they're going to be uh, far better off and farther down the road in terms of their rehab. Another question for you, and that is the, the, the role of the injection that you, you suggested, the steroid. Do you use that primarily diagnostically, or do you feel that, that the steroid can actually reduce the symptoms and buy that patient a significant amount of time? Well, that, that I would answer that in two ways. Um, I feel that it's, it, it confirms your diagnosis. Yes, and two, I do believe that the steroid can help them in buying them time um, with that joint. Um, and in fact, I feel that those patients that do rehab the rotator cuff and get more stability and strength of that shoulder in combination with the injection uh, could potentially um, do well for a long period of time without needing my, my intervention again. I, I think it's kind of that, it, it's that slippery slope with the with these arthritic changes that, you know, there's a tipping point that it just takes a little bit of change and then the arthritis can have a, a, a definite effect on the joint and this, this anti-inflammatory just kind of gets them, that injection just gets them right over, the, over that hill and then they just kind of progress. Well, let's talk a little bit about that slippery slope and I guess the, the next phase is, is when does that slippery slope end in surgery? When do you begin to have the discussion with the patient that, you know, we don't have anything further to offer you in terms of conservative care that seems to be working, and now we need to consider surgical options? Well, it, that's, usually, um, that's usually a combination of I've known that they've done this exercise program for at least a good six-week time frame and I've seen them at that two week mark and then I've seen them back after the injection and I get a feel for um, how significant their improvement has been and if I feel, you know, if they had, if, if they had no response with the injection and, and have continued with their, tried to continue with their strengthening program, um, then I will definitely have that discussion with them that, I, that surgically potentially we can, we can help them in improving their symptoms. Uh, even if they've had a response, it depends on how satisfied that patient is with that response. Um, I'm not apt to repeat that injection if the response has been minimal. Now, I'll repeat it again at a three to four month mark if, if, that, if they get that kind of time frame out of it, but within a short period of time, I typically don't do that, and, and I'll typically have that discussion with them that if, they'd like, if they're looking for more improvement that there are some benefits to looking at the surgical options in treating this. Well, and let's talk about those surgical options. What, what surgical options does this patient have with AC joint arthrosis? Well, again, it depends on the mechanics of, this, of, of what you believe the injury is inside the shoulder. And uh, 
there are, there are some options in, in treating arthritis of the AC joint where you can go in and you can do an open procedure where you make a small incision over the joint and you resect that distal end of the clavicle and uh, that's a that's a procedure that's been done for a very long time it's a it's a it's called a Mumford procedure distal clavicle resection and uh, it, it's it's been known to be uh, the the open type of surgery that can treat this disease in resecting uh, that joint space now I can tell you that I I have done that in the past and I've I've typically gotten away from that type of, of surgery where I'm, I'm doing something a lot less invasive of where I'm going in with the with the arthroscope and instead of resecting the joint itself I'm just resecting the part of the joint that is impinging on the rotator cuff if, if I believe this is more of an impingement process I'll also I can I also will do if it's necessary I will resect the AC joint arthroscopically and but I'm not taking that full centimeter of of bone that typically is done with a Mumford I'm doing just a very small aspect of that joint a very you know maybe half of that distance um, where I'm not resecting that much of the joint at all but I can tell you that I've really gotten more towards just more like a decompression of the AC joint and I where I don't have to even get up into the AC joint I just resect the part that that's been impinging more on the uh, rotator cuff and that's more the typical AC joint problems that I've seen where where I haven't had to be as uh, as radical I guess as I was um, as I typically had done um, many years ago with just resecting the joint itself you know I think it would be useful to point out to patients at this point that that the theory of, of resecting this joint is that there's not a lot of movement at this joint. I mean, this, this joint really is two articular surface, um, or articular ends of the bones or the articular surface of the joint, and there's a, a bit of a, a, a meniscus or a small amount of soft tissue between those points, between those two ends of the bone, but there's not a lot. It, this doesn't bend like the knee does, for example. It doesn't rotate a heck of a lot like the shoulder or something like that. So the theory of, of the, the resection is really to take two ends of the bone that are, are arthritic, rubbing together causing pain, and essentially create a space that fills with scar tissue so that now instead of two, two bones rubbing together, which are very arthritic and painful, you actually create a false joint or almost a, a joint that is formed by scar tissue that's more of a rubber joint that uh, still allows you that little bit of motion that occurs between the clavicle and the, uh, uh, the scapula, but it, it doesn't allow the two bone ends to rub together. And for years, that's been the, the, the strategy that we've used to, to try and reduce pain from AC joint arthrosis. But it, it, as you pointed out, that, that solution does have its problems, and especially if you destabilize that joint by damaging the ligaments that are, for all intents and purposes, normal, um, you can create a problem in that joint as well as, as try to solve a problem. So I like your notion of, of trying to do a minimalistic uh, approach to this that doesn't uh, have those uh, side effects of destabilizing the joint and potentially giving the patient just another painful uh, problem. Um, can you give us some idea of what you feel like your success rate at, at, at taking this approach has been? Yes, well, the, I think the minimalistic approach of just resecting the AC joint uh, or just doing a decompression of the AC joint has been, in my hands, has been very beneficial and uh, very successful. And uh, I'd say just as it complements the other statistics out there, at least the 85 to 90 percent of them with, with significant improvement and um, the and, and again I, I will tell you that most of my patients that present with this are not a high demand user of their shoulder um, you know it's not that they're going to be uh, it's not like they're going back to where they're painting overhead with their shoulder um, eight to ten hours a day afterwards those type of patients, that's the patient that I will take the approach of arthroscopically doing the resection but not opening it and resecting the, the uh, bone as, we, as you had discussed 
I don't want to destabilize the shoulder any further. So I will take a little more aggressive approach with those type of patients, but for the most part, the decompressions that I do of that AC joint are very successful, and um, these are patients that with typically within four to six weeks um, of rehabilitation, I have them back to their full activities um, that they were not able to enjoy um, prior to that process. Well, a couple of uh, points about the logistics of this operation. You mentioned that you're doing this arthroscopically now. I'm assuming that this is an outpatient procedure? Yes, again, this is an outpatient procedure. It's, a, it's under a general anesthetic. Uh, again, they start therapy the following day. Uh, I keep them in a sling for anywhere from uh, two to four weeks of, um, during their physical therapy. And uh, again, encouraging motion immediately and working on the, uh, the, the rotator cuff and, and the scapular mechanics initially. And, and how long do you think that it takes a patient to get over this operation to the point to where they're pretty much done and, and they're as good as they're going to get? Well, I, I, I will have some patients that immediately will tell you within two weeks that they've, they're 100% better just because you've taken that decompression off that cuff that rotator cuff. So I, I usually will, will, you know, if you take all the patients in, a, in that bell curve, it's usually about six weeks that I tell them to anticipate before they'll be back to doing the things that they want to do. Now, the AC joint resections that I do, completely arthroscopic, those, and those patients that have the high demand on the shoulder, um, I will delay those patients another six weeks. So it would be about three months for those patients before I allow them to go back to that heavy labor use of the shoulder or, or say it's a um, specific sporting event, it'd be at th between that three to four month mark because I'm not only, you know, number one, I'm looking to improve that pain to get them to a zero pain level, but then I'm working on reconditioning the shoulder also. So it takes a little bit more time with those patients. And finally, is there, are there any complications that you feel uh, are pertinent to this operation or this disease process that you feel like patients ought to know about? As far as the complications, I think, I think it's important to explain to them uh, the, the potential problems with injecting a steroid into that shoulder joint um, if I haven't gotten the MRI, if I suspect that the rotator cuff is intact, I still let them know that, you know, if there is a partial tear there, that I, I am concerned about the use of the steroid and that we're probably just going to go with one injection and that I don't want to do anything more to make that, that if there is a cuff injury associated, I certainly don't want to accelerate that or make that any worse, with which potentially the steroid could have that effect. Um, the other thing with the surgical approach that I'm, I guess that I'm the most concerned with is when you're around this AC joint, uh, there, there potentially you can get into some bleeding problems in the shoulder where you have to be attentive to where some patients, and, and I used to see this more with the open procedures. I don't see this as much with my um, arthroscopic procedures, but with with that, you've got to be worried a little bit about when you're doing a full resection of the clavicle is the bleeding problems you can have postoperatively where they can get little hematomas and sometimes you, you do have to go back in and open those up and decompress them again. So that, that's really, the, I think, the most important thing with those. Well, I think this has been a very comprehensive discussion about AC joint arthrosis and the treatment options that patients have. Is there anything that, that you think patients ought to know that we haven't discussed during this um, episode as we close? Yeah, I, I think it's the, um, it's in my practice, the most difficult thing I find with, with treating more of the, the patients with the AC joint problems is, is that if you get to that status of say I follow them up at two weeks and then I inject them and they feel 100% better, they feel like they don't need to do those exercises anymore and that they're, they're great and they're good to go. And that's my biggest problem is emphasizing them to them why that's important and the need to do that to keep them from coming back to see me again. And uh, it's hard to explain muscle strengthening of the shoulder where you can't even see those muscles and the exercises they're doing, they don't really feel are you know, they're not seeing any 
muscle building around the shoulder because they're muscles you can't see. So it's something that I try to make sure I have a, a, that discussion with them beforehand so they understand that importance. But that's always a battle, I think. Well, thanks for that uh, useful commentary, and I, I totally agree. I think, I think uh, compliance is one of the things that, that patients are going to have to do if they're going to get better. So thanks for pointing that out. I want to thank you for joining us today and look forward to further discussions in the future. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Randy. I look forward to seeing you again.